Today, I will speak about the phenomenon that Rabindranath was, a nation builder in his own country, an undivided India, and a cultural ambassador on the international stage, a man who strove to bring the East and West closer together through mutual respect, understanding, exchange and collaboration in what was an untiring one-man mission. I will use two metaphors, that of a confluence of rivers and of a nest, to tell the story of a visionary whose work continues to inspire us many decades after his death. Rabindranath lived his entire life as a British subject when, under the leadership of Gandhi, India witnessed a great nationalist movement which adopted non-violence and passive resistance through non-cooperation as its methods of resistance, which succeeded in ending 250 years of British rule. Rabindranath, Gandhi and Nehru, India's first Prime Minister after independence, were all nation builders. And while Gandhi was Nehru's political guru, Rabindranath was his intellectual guru. They were the architects of modern India. In order to understand Tagore's national dream and global vision, it is important to know his background, his illustrious family, his spectacular and unusual upbringing, and the transformations that he witnessed in the Bengal Renaissance, his native state, which led Bengal and subsequently India into the modern age. It is not possible to span a crowded lifetime in a short talk, so I will give vignettes in order to give you a sense of Tagore's local and global contributions. Tagore was born of 1861 at Jorashako, the Tagore family home, popularly known as Thakurbari in Calcutta on the Hooghly River, a distributary of the Ganges, the epicenter of the Bengal Renaissance. Rabindranath was the 14th child of Mahashi Devendranath and Sharuda Devi. The Indian revolt of 1857 had been violently quelled and the crown had taken over the East India Company's provinces in 1858, ruling from Calcutta, the eastern capital of the British Empire. Tagore concedes that he was born into a family that was remarkable and, quote, a great period in our history in Bengal, unquote, where a great confluence of cultures took place, Hindu, Mohammedan and British. The references to cultural pluralism rather than religious distinctions. Tagore's ancestors had learnt English and French through their association with traders in cosmopolitan Bengal. Both his grandfather, Prince Darkonath, and his father, Mahoshi Devendranath, were well-versed in Persian, Arabic, English, and Bengali. This was a household where Sanskrit texts were read alongside passages from Hafiz, and Shakespeare remained an inspiration. The admixture of Muslim, Hindu, and Western styles found expression through the generations in literary and cultural experiments. The furniture purchased, the dress designed, and created at Jurashako, where East and West met in a nest, in a confluence that signified a syncretism that marked the Tagores of Jurashako. It was the stifling experience of unimaginative teaching methods in Calcutta's leading schools which relied on rote learning, that Tagore felt prison walls closing in on him, compelling the bored young boy to become a school dropout. However, his learning continued unabated at Jorashako, with tutors coming from dawn till long after dusk to teach the Tagore children diverse subjects ranging from gymnastics and anatomy to literature, language and art. After Tagore's sacred threat ceremony, a rite of passage for Brahmin boys, Debindranath asked him whether he would like to accompany him on his travels. Rabindranath was super excited. It was an escape from school and possible bullying because of his ritually shaven head. The first stop was in Birbhum district, a dry expanse of land where Debindranath had, 
on an earlier trip, meditated under a chhatim tree and experienced an infinite peace, Shanti. He bought this expanse and called it Shanti Niketan, the abode of peace. This is where Rabindranath was free to roam, imagining himself a conqueror in his own Lilliput. On the way to the Himalayas, they stopped at the Golden Temple in Amritsar, and joined in the hymns sung by Sikh devotees. The syncretic confluence of religious worship making a deep impression on young Rabindranath. And once they were up in the Himalayas, Debindranath continued a strict routine of early rising, cold showers, English and Bengali lessons, which continued with Debindranath as his teacher, who introduced him to the Upanishads and ended with astronomy with the night sky as the teacher. These days of freedom and routine stayed with Rabindranath, enabling him to fit in multiple tasks in a day. Back in the Tagore household, literature and art flourished through magazines like the Bharati, and novels, plays, operas, songs, poetry, children's literature, grammar, art, shorthand and mathematics manuals poured out from various family members, a beehive of creativity in which young Rabindranath's imagination and innovation found expression and thrived. Amidst this creative hub, Tagore's constant muse and sharp literary critic was his affectionate and accomplished sister-in-law, Kadambari, his fifth brother, Jyotirindranath's wife. Kadambari took the shy young Ruby under her wing and gave him the protection he needed, especially after his mother died when he was only 14. However, Rabindranath's eldest brother, Shatendranath, the first Indian to join the Indian Civil Service, must have felt that Rabindranath needed to stop frittering his life away in dreamy-eyed creativity and proposed to Debindranath that he would take Ruby to England to study law. Rabindranath set sail for England in 1878. Apart from two enjoyable periods with his sister-in-law's family in Brighton and Devonshire, his stay in two English households left deep impressions on him. The Scott family, with its affectionate mother and talented sisters, was where Ruby encountered Western hospitality and sang Thomas Moore's Irish and Scottish melodies with the Scott daughters, melodies which he would later adapt in his own brand of Rabindra Shungit, 2,200 songs. He stayed with the Barker couple, and in both Mrs. Barker and Mrs. Scott, he experienced kindly, motherly affection in ladies who were great housekeepers and warm hostesses, who affirmed for Rabindranath the universality of feminine hospitality, this very idea of caring, welcoming homes would stay with Rabindranath when he set up his own educational institution in Shantiniketan and later his rural reconstruction centre at Srinikatan, the nest where he welcomed the world as his guests. While in London, at the request of the third Scott daughter, Rabindranath proceeded to teach her Bengali, a language he believed had set rational rules unlike English, but he was soon thrown by its complexity. He went on to study the Bengali language at the London University Library making prodigious notes. His little suitcase with the notes when he came back to India was emptied of its contents by a little Tagore girl who decided that the case was better for her doll's wedding trousseau. However, Rabindranath did remember his Bengali studies for his own educational texts and his work on modernizing the Bengali language in his own writing continued. His belief that school education should be in the mother tongue stayed with him right through his life as a nation builder. At the University College, Tagore was enrolled in the Faculty of Arts and Law, 
but he was particularly impressed by Henry Morley's lectures on English literature and his method of teaching, which encouraged academic debates through critical thinking and anonymously submitted reflective essays, which Morley discussed in class. It was here that Rabindranath renewed his love of Shakespeare, which he had started reading as a boy at Durashako, and now read the Clarendon Press editions. Soon after his return from England, three life-changing events occurred in his life. He married Bhavatarini, renamed Mrinalini in a rather uneventful ceremony. Kadambari, who had been suffering from prolonged periods of depression, committed suicide, leaving Rabindranath and the Tagore household desolate and Tagore bereft of his muse and critic. Around the same time, Debendranath, his father, entrusted the supervision of his landed estates in and around Shilai Daho, now in Bangladesh, to Ruby. It was a perceptive move on the part of the Jurashaku patriarch, who must have noted a reliability and responsibility in his youngest dreaming poet son, under whose creative, constructive landlordship the estates continued to thrive. It was here that Rabindranath was shocked to encounter the apathy of village folk and set about building cooperatives and implementing schools and roads and various schemes for rural resuscitation and uplift to dissipate the sense of hopelessness and instill self-reliance, Atushakti, and restore dignity amongst his people. The experience of his Shilai Daho's days would lead his writing of many short stories which reflected the lives of common folk in the forgotten villages of Bengal, using conversational Bengali. During this time, he also encountered the Baals, the wandering minstrels of Bengal, whom he invited and had their lyrics written down. The Baal repertoire and philosophy of universal love of freedom and their concept of the Munir Manush, the being within each of us, influenced Rabindranath deeply. Later at Shantinigatan's Pushmala, its winter festival, the Baals were given and continue to be given a special platform for creative expression that transcends religious boundaries. At Chilai Daho, Rabindranath taught his children himself, but he knew this wasn't enough. His experience of the mind-numbing rote method in the schools he had attended had convinced him that learning needed to be creative, imaginative and inspirational, encouraging curiosity and debate. So in December 1901, he moved with his young family to Shantinigatan and started his own school with five boys, amongst whom was his own son, Ruthindranath. Initially, the school was named Brahmacharya Ashram, following the Upanishadic tradition. But true to Rabindranath's own ideal of freedom, it was imbued with what became known as the Rabindric spirit, free from orthodoxy and religious constraints. He imbibed the traditional Indian Guru Shishya, disciple, pupil, teacher, model, in a lived experience of holistic learning. In his essay, A Poet's School, Rabindranath describes how his students, quote, take great pleasure in cooking, weaving, gardening, improving their surroundings and in rendering services to other boys, very often secretly, lest they should feel embarrassed. He says, quote, their classwork has not been separated from their normal activities, but forms a part of their daily current of life, unquote. Ruthindranath, his son, speaks of the sense of camaraderie that existed as joys and sorrows were shared by teachers and pupils, an essentially happy lot. He also speaks of his father's presence and participation when he was there. As he never tired of composing songs and poems and singing, reciting them, rehearsing and directing his plays, recounting stories from the Indian epic, the Mahabharata, taking classes and playing indoor games with the boys. 
the school at Shantinikitan began with meagre resources. Weather permitting, the classes were held under trees, where student and teacher were close to nature, in these classrooms without walls. The love of nature, the close association with one's environment, were nurtured here, and simplicity, not the virtue of poverty, was adopted as a way of life for building character. Rabindranath remembered his own experience of school days and, quote, the fact that they did not have the completeness of the world. But children are in love with life and it is their first love, unquote. This was the nest he built first for boys and then for girls from all sorts of backgrounds who came to study in a residential school, which became the indicator for his campus university. Initially, there were five teachers, three of whom were Christian. All his life, Rabindranath was in search of the good teacher as the essential epicenter for effective learning. He, he invited talented people in India and abroad to come and teach at his institution, his nest where the whole world met. But matters affecting the Bengal province soon called Rabindranath away from Shantinikitan his abode of peace. In January 1904, when the idea of the first partition of Bengal was proposed by Lord Curzon, the Shadeshi movement, homegrown indigenous movement, resisting foreign domination gathered strength. In this year, Rabindranath gave his lecture on Shadeshi Shamaj, society and state to a packed audience in Minerva Theatre in Calcutta, where he pointed out that most of India's population lived in villages. This was the Shamaj society, the community that signified India. In his lecture, he laid out a comprehensive program for the rural reconstruction of Bengal based on developing self-reliance, Atta Shukti a proposal which was marked by his distinctive brand of constructive nationalism, not narrow nationalism. When the official announcement was made about partition, Rabindranath was vociferous in his protest. He gave lectures and his poetry and other writing voiced his resistance to the idea of vivisection. It was during this period in a surge of patriotism that he composed 23 patriotic songs, singing some of them as he led processions and the songs were sung in turn with fervent protesters against Bengal being divided. These moving songs which evoked the fertile landscape, the many rivers and the spirit of Bengal would prompt Ezra Pound to say that Rabindranath sang Bengal into a nation. However, Rabindranath was not an advocate of narrow nationalism, and as the Shadeshi movement turned to boycott and burning of foreign goods and violence, he pulled himself back from the nationalist politics and retreated to Shantinigatan to pour his energies into education and creativity, causing much misunderstanding and criticism among the public who saw his abandonment of the Shadeshi movement as unpatriotic. Later, he explained his stand in his novel, Ghori Bairi, The Home in the World, made into a film by Satyajit Ray. In it, Nikhilesh, the liberal philanthropic landlord, sees the danger of communal divisiveness and violence under the leadership of the short-sighted, self-serving firebrand, Shundip. The book, however, met with an onslaught of criticism by Rabindranath's detractors. At Shantanigatan, Rabindranath immersed himself in many creative projects, writing, education and rural engagement. He worked to free young minds in his own institution through freedom of thought and creative activity, adopting an interdisciplinary system. This was his contribution to nation building through character building. It was at this stage that he felt he needed trained agriculturalists to take forward his rural reconstruction program. He sent his son Rothindranath, Rothi's friend Shantush, and his own son-in-law, not to Oxford, Cambridge or Harvard, as was the norm with enlightened Indian families, but to the University of Illinois in Urbana, 
USA to study agriculture and animal husbandry and bring back the knowledge and expertise to improve rural India. The Shantaniketan experiment would prove a financial burden in the years to come. And selling his seafront house at Puri, selling his wife's jewelry, realizing the annual income from the Ashrams Trust and his own slim monthly income poured into the institution was, didn't prove enough. As time went on, he sold the copyright of his publications to find money to sustain his institution. In a letter to his friend and close associate, the English missionary Charles Freer Andrews, he wrote, I quote, I sold my books, my copyright, everything I had I, in order to carry on with the school. I cannot really tell you what a struggle it was. By 1912, Rabindranath was already a household name in Bengal and a much respected literary personality in India. This was when he decided to go to England for treatment. It proved to be a turning point in his career. He carried with him a manuscript with his English translation of Gitanjali, his poems, which he had done for the painter William Rothenstein of the Bloomsbury Group at the latter's request. Rothenstein was deeply impressed by the verse, which he passed on to W.B. Yeats, who too was greatly moved and wrote an impassioned introduction to Gitanjali. A limited edition of the book was published by the India Society in 1912 and circulated, read and appreciated by some leading figures amongst London's literary elite, including Ezra Pound. From England, Rabindranath went to Urbana, Illinois to be near his son's university and have a quiet holiday. Here, in the backwaters of a university campus in the Midwest, Professor Arthur Seymour and his wife, Mace, were his warm hosts. And Rabindranath met several academics and church ministers. It was perhaps here that the idea of a campus university took root in his mind. His peaceful holiday was, however, interrupted by several invitations to deliver lectures. Also at Harvard, where T.S. Eliot sat in, and we remember in the wasteland, he ended with the word Shanti, peace. In November 1913, Rabindranath was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature, nominated by Thomas Sturgmore of the Indian Society the first non-white to receive it when he was still a subject of a subject nation. The award was for Tagore's entire body of writing till then, his educational work and in appreciation of the socio-cultural and religious reforms his family had led and Rabindranath had continued to implement and practice. And not for just one volume, Gitanjali, as is erroneously believed. The award pushed Rabindranath to his and his contemporaries' surprise onto the world stage. Invitations poured in from intellectuals, artists, political leaders, and Rabindranath henceforth took a conscious decision to address his audience and like-minded individuals across the world, not in Bengali, but in English, in his lectures and letters. He travelled to around 34 countries, to some several times and took on the role of a cultural ambassador to bring the world closer through mutual understanding and exchange. While boycott, picketing and non-cooperation marked Gandhi's campaign of Swaraj, home rule, Rabindranath wrote to Andrews in May 1921, I quote, I am a poet, not a fighter. What irony of fate is this that I should be preaching cooperation of cultures between East and West on this side of the sea, just at the moment when the doctrine of non-cooperation is preached on the other. Gandhi and Tagore would debate on issues of cooperation, passive resistance and spinning of the charka in the public arena in written exchanges. But the mutual regard was evident and astonishingly, whenever Gandhiji was arrested and jailed, Tagore's pen on contested ideas fell silent. 
On 22nd December 1918, at a special meeting at Shantanigatan, Tagore explained his idea of Vishwa Bharati, an international university, to his students, teachers and invited guests. It was to be an institution where differences of religion, caste, race and class would be smoothened through people from all backgrounds coming to study together and teach. It would be a cultural learning center promoting cooperation and coordination between East and the West and engaging in collaborative research. Its motto, Yatra Visham Bhavati Ekanidam, where the world meets in one nest, embodies Rabindranath's ideal of social inclusion, universal understanding and acceptance. Vishwa Bharati was formally established three years later, on the same date in 1921. Here he sought to bring the humanities, social sciences and sciences together in a holistic education, very much in tune with the ideas of Patrick Geddes, the Scottish town planner, educationist and environmentalist, who was a close friend of Rabindranath's and like him, a polymath. At Rabindranath's request, Geddes provided plans for Vishwabharati and remained in correspondence with the poet till Geddes' death in 1932. From 1922, work began in earnest at the Rural Reconstruction Center at Shurul that Rabindranath named Srinikitan, abode of well-being. With the objective of bringing hope and self-defendency through participation in a revitalization program that encouraged and thrived on interdependency and interchange between the institution and the surrounding villages under the impetus of the agricultural scientist Leonard Elmhurst and in his absence, Arthur Geddes, Patrick Geddes' geographer's son, whose PhD thesis was on the land of Tagore and who spent two years teaching at Shantanigatan, taking forward Patrick Geddes' ideas on the ground. Tagore wanted his university to be not only in touch with its surroundings, but a continuation of it, practicing agriculture, gardening, weaving, and dairy keeping, with students and teachers working with the with and learning from ordinary people in the neighboring villages in an atmosphere of mutual appreciation, learning and exchange. In fact, exchange was the key word for Rabindranath's nest. It would be a place which offered hospitality to guests and cultures from elsewhere in the Indian tradition, just as Mrs. Scott and Mrs. Barker had provided for Rabindranath in London. Rabindranath made it clear that, quote, my guests from the West must be made welcome here. His university would, quote, invite students from the West and the Far East to study the systems of Indian philosophy, literature, art and music in their proper environment. Rabindranath felt that India, who had given much in the past, had become isolated through recurrent conquests and through her own internal constructs of social exclusion and could now, in the new age, offer something to the world in the aftermath of the wreckage wrought by World War I, a message of peace through cooperation. The first foreign scholars who came and taught at Bishwabharati included Professor Sylvain Levy, the renowned Indologist from Sorbonne University, who taught Chinese and Tibetan languages and dedicated his life to establishing cultural links between West and India. Mrs. Levy taught French literature. Tina Bhavan, a dedicated institute for Chinese studies, was later founded in 1937 with the help of the Chinese scholar Tan Yan Shan. The Orientalist Professor Moritz Winternitz of the Oriental Institute of Prague came to Vishwabharati, other foreign scholars followed. The names of scholars who came and taught are many. In Vishwabharati's nest, Rabindranath engendered a confluence of minds. And while the world came to Shantanigatan, Rabindranath went across the world, adopting what Michael Collins has called a political strategy to bring the East and West together through dialogue and collaboration through the 
liberal politics of friendship. This urgency in Rabindranath to forge an understanding that would lead to peace, development and a sustainable environment stemmed from his belief in the unity of spirit in mankind, a global vision which prompted Tagore to strive to forge greater amity between nations and peoples. William Radite, the renowned Tagore scholar, has written, he wrote so much, he did so much, he created so much, he was truly global. Rabindranath's output was phenomenal. India's debt to him is immense and his legacy remains in his school, International University, Rural Reconstruction Centre, his ideas on the environment, his philosophy, writings in history, science, novels, short stories, poetry, paintings, 2,300 paintings, his songs, plays, essays, sermons, dance dramas, lectures, letters, his modernizing of the Bengali language and literature, the feminine freedoms that he preached and adopted, giving recognition to the arts and the dignity to the artist through knowledge exchange between university and the hinterland, the rural and the urban, India and the global context, the home and the world. In Bengal, Rabindranath remains an industry and in India, a resource for scholarly interpretation, translation studies and media projects, inspiring India film industry with his songs and stories. He wrote and worked indefatigably till he died in 1941. In fact, if Tagore had not been so close to us in time, future generations would have found it difficult to believe that this is the work of one man and not a school of disciples taking forward the ideas and tasks of a visionary. Till the end, even when he wrote Crisis in Civilization in 1941, Rabindranath did not lose his faith in humanity. He continued to believe in India's resilience and India's position as a nation which could give much to the world, especially as World War II ruptured it after two tentative de decades of a tenuous peace in the West. India's image was enhanced her dignity salvaged by his genius during colonial rule. His persona and work continue to sustain India, which thrives today on the powerful appeal of his work. And as Otul Chandragupta has said, his compatriots have used his literary talents as the fortress of their dignity, which has provided them with a life breath. Interestingly, Rabindranath described his institution as a place of pilgrimage in the New Age, where there would be a confluence, a meeting of truths. Today, Shantiniketan, the school and the university, and Sriniketan remain a place of cultural pilgrimage in India, which many Indians and foreigners make it their sought out destination. Some drawn to it from curiosity and many with the sense of paying homage to India's myriad-minded man in the nest he built where the world could meet.